introduction. So as you say what you're doing, what is your PhD project about, what do you expect from the course? Because again, there were some prerequisites of the course. Uh, I, I received email from some of you who said you don't know anything about communication. But, I mean, I, we can adapt a little bit the language here to to fit that, but uh, but in the end, it has to go with uh, at least at two speeds, right? People who know something about communication and people who don't know, so they both get something out of it, right? So uh, I think, uh, yeah, maybe we start with a round of introduction from Okay. Anas. So my name is Anas, and I'm a PhD student in the Gans School. And I'm basically my PhD is about uh, this ultra-reliable low latency communication. Um, my expectations from the course, mm, I, I guess it's basically to get an overview of somewhat the state of the art in, in this in this field. Thanks, Hans. Hirl is a guest from another university. Hello, I'm a visiting researcher. My name is Hirli Alves. I'm from Oulu University in Finland. I'm working on ultra-reliable communication, machine reliable communication in general. And I uh, then then the course to refresh some concepts and, and see some other views of from from other perspectives. Uh, I am Jan Arthur. I'm from Wireless Communication Station. Uh, I've been in my PhD and in the half of my PhD, <laughs> one and a half years, that's fun. <laughs> and uh, I've present most fairly most on you. Uh, my work is on the ultra reliable and low latest communication, more in the protocol designs and solutions for, for this type of communications. And my, uh, yeah, what I expect from this course is to also to update uh, with the recent research and have a better uh, understanding of some uh, concepts from the communication theory also. Good morning, everyone. <coughs> My name is Bahram, and uh, I'm from, uh, I'm a pure uh, power system engineering guy, so I'm one of those ways to the center the domain. And uh, uh, I'm from Energy Technique. My project, creation project, is about uh, energy internet and its operation in most microgrid classes, so I, I think I really need this course. Thank Great. You. Who's your supervisor? Joseph. Uh, hey, my name is Alufaz. I'm a research assistant in the activity section. My research project is about massive MIMO. And what I expect from this course is having insight about IoT and Hello everyone, this is Tyler Isoli. I'm working uh, for my industrial PhD studies with the wireless network section with the prepared mm -hmm. momentum. Uh, my PhD topic uh, is about uh, the end to end scheduling problem in ultra low latency and ultra reliable and low latency communication. I'm just in the beginning, and what I expect from this course is to have some like insight about the differences between what's existing and what's required because of the IP. Okay. Thanks. Hello everyone, my name is Roberto. I'm a PhD student from the wireless communication section. My PhD study is focused on the license spectrum to meet the requirements of to meet the requirements of ultra reliable and latency communications. Um, for the course for the course I expect to have uh, an overview of IoT and how uh, IoT technology works in the unlicensed spectrum we have some mm. information there in the, in the course. Okay, I think that will be on the mostly about that will be on the third day. Okay. Um, my name is Mohammed Saif uh, I'm a PhD student in wireless communication networks at Iraq. We are working on adaptive data collection system for uh, resource constrained networks, focusing on smart metering infrastructures. Mm -hmm. uh, what I 
<laughs> expect from this course to have a better understanding of wireless communication for IoT. Uh, and mostly interested in reliability and performance analysis of uh, communication systems. Good. Yeah, hello, I'm Constantino Dugas. I'm a PhD student at the Wireless Communication Networks uh, section. My PhD topic is about the spectrum sharing, non orthogonal spectrum sharing, so collocation of frequency and time of two systems. Uh, and basically, I'm uh, interested in this course about finding out what are the solutions for addressing the latency and power, uh, power consumption constraints in IoT. Mm -hmm. Constantinos, did you also go on? Yes. Hi, my name is Tomasz. I'm also from WCM section. Uh, my PhD is about spatial channel characteristics and evaluation of multi antenna techniques for UAV communications. Mm -hmm. What I expect from this course is kind of two things. One is to learn something more from information theory point of view on how to design IoT system and how to describe them, and also follow up on standardization on the robust IoT was going on. Okay, I think that second thing will be tomorrow. So I'm Elizabeth, I'm not a PhD. I'm just auditing here a little bit and I wanted to know is it more about uh, uh, information theory and uh, short packets. But you do have a PhD, that's important. I have a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's an important part. Okay. So how many are missing? Who is missing? Radek should come here. So, so how uh, there is one from energy missing, yes. Abdul, Wahid, yes. and then there is a one 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 what's his name? Ali. Ali, Ali yes. And uh, Radek was supposed to come to the course, or you don't know? I actually don't know what to say about. Okay. Yes. Okay. Let's start. So uh, <coughs> today will be uh, in the in the morning. It will be mostly about uh, introduction to IoT communication models. I think uh, it's very important to understand the communication models and the limitations before you do anything in the coming days about algorithms for communication and so on. So I think this is the key point from pedagogical uh, viewpoint. So we are going to spend quite quite a bit of time on that. So. Uh, so first is IoT and its position in 5G. Then uh, the access problem and the architecture for massive access. So what is uh, also, also for uh, ultra-reliable access. And then communication models. That will be the core of today's lecture. And then we're going to speak a little bit about short packet transmission. I, I, I don't know how much in details I can go there. And uh, there are some people here who know quite a bit about it. But um, I think the core take-home message will be from the communication models part. Uh, and this course has been given as a part of the 5G course in uh, Gothenburg in uh, May. Uh, now there's a small uh, change, so I think some of you, two of you at least were there. So uh, feel free to jump in if I, if, I, if I forget to tell something. Okay, so, uh, so there, is a, there is a little bit of, of con confusion sometimes about what is M2M what is machine type communication? What is IoT? So, uh, so what's the difference between IoT and uh, and MTC? When when you if somebody from the street comes to you, and I think 
you will be the people who will be asked about this. They say, I read about this machine type communication in this Internet of Things. What's the difference? First of all, is there a difference? People tend to use them as two, two words that they have the same meaning very, very often. But they don't, they don't uh, have the same meaning. In, in my mind, in very simplified terms, uh, IoT means uh, even everyday objects or, or sensors or actuators, but even everyday objects that they have access to the internet and to the 5G network in general. Mm -hmm. While machine type communication means communication between two devices with, without or with minimal human intervention, without uh, being assumed that they are connected to the internet or to some external public network, let's say. Okay, that it, it is machine to machine. It's, yes. not a, it's not IoT, it's not internet of mm -hmm. things, internet of everything. That's my a very subtle difference, let's say, in this with me. But I think machine to machine was assumed that there are two in the autonomous devices communicating, but actually they changed the name to machine type communication because uh, it's not that it always has to be two machines communicating. Sometimes you have to give the output to the, to the human, right? So that's why machine type communication is more general. But I think Internet of Things, uh, you should really understand it as a, as a, as a level which is at, at one step higher compared to uh, machine type communication, you know, where you make this web of objects, where you interconnect the objects, and there are enabling technologies that make these things interconnect. And such an enabling technology is machine type communication, right? But, but another technology that would enable the Internet of Things is not only machine type communication, it's some uh, authentication, certification, security mechanism, uh, right? Some routing throughout the wired network because when we say machine type communication, we don't really think about the routing through the network. We think only about the wireless access part, right? So somehow it's a, it's a hierarchical that the Internet of Things uh, in, uh, is on, on top of something which is machine type communication, which is enabling it, right? So, uh, but uh, what the, de the definition that you can find is that it's a set of uh, information and communication technologies able to measure, deliver, process, mine data, and react in autonomous fashion. Uh, involving minimum hu minimal human intervention. I think uh, maybe it's not uh, it's not correct to say that minimal human intervention, but probably they have to represent the data in a way that is minim minim meaningful to the humans. Right? And this has uh, so this is related to the wave of big data with respect to you know, scalability, getting a, a lot of data from uh, from different sources, ubiquity, having it in every place. Uh, heterogeneity, and this is an important feature, meaning that the capabilities and the requirements of these devices will differ. And I think this is one of the most important research topics that we are going to see in the coming years. How do you deal with heterogeneous capabilities and, re and, uh, and requirements, right? This is sometimes called uh, to be addressed by the technology called network slicing, right? So you, you slice the resources and you say you get, so you fulfill your requirements, you fulfill the other requirements and so on. So uh, meaning that in a complex system like a smart grid, there are a lot of different services. So, so they don't have the same requirements. For example, teleprotection requires low latency. Uh, trading of energy uh, requires some reliability, but not as uh, lo low latency. And then uh, interconnection of loads, coupling of loads with, with generators requires another thing, and so on. So uh, my point is that this, this is going to uh, it's, it's going to be a big thing how to uh, interconnect, uh, how to interconnect different uh, types of devices and uh, coexist different types of services. So uh, I th another thing is uh, that many of this will be real time. So when we say real time, uh, the latency requirement might vary from you know, one millisecond to 10 to 20, even to 50, 60 milliseconds. That's also real time. But the point is that the data is coming and you have to process it. So kind of the, the world becomes a big database that provides you with data, and you have to react to that data. And uh, another thing is the reliability. And this is, this is an important thing, because I think when, when this IoT started, if you look at the uh, sick folks and all the others who are working in unlicensed band, the reliability was so-so. 
you know, you say that once per day you can get the the packet, or if you have smart metering, you say some packets can be lost, is no problem, and so on. But I think as these technologies are maturing, we start to require more, more and more reliability. This is natural, right? Because 15 years ago we were not annoyed if there was no Wi-Fi, but nowadays it's a commodity. So if there's no Wi-Fi, it's strange, right? So in that sense, once you once this starts to go, uh, once this technology starts to proliferate, to penetrate different uh, areas, then you expect that the reliability is very high. So I think uh, uh, that this uh, requirement on reliability that were not as high to this mass massive machine type communication, this is going to change. Another thing that is going to change is that uh, this was traditionally uplink oriented system. You know, uh, for example, if you look at uh, NBIoT, uh, LoRa, Sigfox, they are oriented towards uplink transmissions. But in a, in a, in a cyber-physical system, uplink transmission means that transmitting report from sensor to the network. But in real cyber-physical system, we also have to have the backward link, right? So the downlink, because we need to take action. So I think that, that uh, more and more services of this machine type communication are going to have multi-way or two-way communication. So uh, the thing, uh, the thing that, that we, we can hear about the Internet of Things is that anything that can be connected will be connected. And then the predictions about how many devices will be connected have been varying, right? From 50 billion, uh, 20 billion, uh, you know, uh, very, very different numbers. But the thing is that once everything starts to get connected, then everything becomes vulnerable. So, uh, so we are mostly here, communication engineers and, or hardware engineers, as you said, working with the, with the systems, but not many security engineers around. These systems uh, are going to, to pose immense security challenge in the years to come. Because our uh, assignment now is how to connect them. The point afterwards will be you know, how, uh, how to keep them uh, reliable. The problem with this is that if you start, uh, if you start to uh, outsource some service to connected system, and you start to trust that system, if that fails, you know you go like ten years back. You're going to you're going to completely remove it and start from the beginning until until you start to trust that system again. So my my point is that. Uh, the proliferation of Internet of Things will very much depend on how, how secure we can make it. Uh, so uh, the heterogeneity, as I mentioned, is in terms of device types. There are some devices that are driven by battery. There are some type the devices that are actually plugged into the grid. So, so energy is not a, an issue there, right? Uh, and some of you know that if I have energy constraint, an energy unconstrained device, the communication strategy is very different. And it's not that the same protocol should be used in both cases. Uh, then different applications, as I mentioned, different traffic patterns, and I think you will hear about that on Wednesday a little bit, and different performance requirements. So how do you uh, put uh, the two systems where one requires reliability of 90% per packet, and the other requires reliability of 99.999% per packet. How would you mix them? It's not obvious, right? Uh, so some examples of uh, uh, some examples of IoT systems is, for example, water metering. Uh, and the, you know, this is the potential uh, topology of how it would look like. Uh, there is a dedicated network, another network which is uh, delivering it to uh, the, the customer, you know, analyzing the data and so on. The important point is what is, what is in for us? Why, why do we do this? Because this is going to solve some significant societal problems. In the, in the case of water metering, it is a water leakage. So there are countries, there are cities where, you know, the leakage of the water goes to 40 or 50 percent. You know, there, there are cities where just 40 or 50 percent of the water goes somewhere, and you don't know where. Uh, so the, the, the point is that this Internet of Things is going to, to put this monitoring on the physical world and give you an insight about what is happening. Uh, 
for example, uh, uh, vending machines. So, uh, how would this contribute to the societal problem? What do you think? How would you this solve some problem in society if we if we have vending machines that have Internet of Things? We might uh, trigger a notification when uh, some product uh, runs out. So the refilling, let's say, of products is more smoothly and so on, which... Okay. Uh, yeah, it has some but impact. But when you return and there is a call out there, it's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, but, but I, I think, I think that the, pro the point is that once the connectivity is there, you can come up with different applications. For example, the big, one big societal problem that this can solve, not the vending machine specifically, but connecting food to uh, how it's called to the internet is a food waste right because uh, if uh, we, we have a lot of wasted food so basically if a, if a product starts to expire it can start to signal that I'm expiring in two days so my price decreases and people are going to buy it, right so you have a new market for food which is not going to you know let the let, let, let the food to go going wasted so, uh, so what is the place of uh, machine type communication in 5G? So this is a picture we have used two years ago in a book called 5G Wireless and Mobile Communication Technology. Uh, and at that time, uh, we, uh, this it was already clear that there will be three legs, three generic services in 5G. Extended uh, machine, uh, mobile broadband, massive machine type communication, and ultra-reliable uh, low latency communication. And actually, uh, looking from the optimistic perspective of IoT, we can say that two-thirds of 5G is about IoT. So we have massive machine-type communication, uh, where by massive we mean services like uh, smart city, infrastructures and objects. Uh, we have low cost, low energy, small data volumes, massive numbers, as we say, mass a very large density of devices within some area. Right? And then we have ultra-reliable, very low latency and very high reliability in ultra-reliable, low latency machine type communication, where uh, examples are autonomous vehicle control, uh, control of smart grid with low latency, factory cell automation. Uh, now with the aug augmented reality, for example, in augmented reality, in principle, you are digitally interacting with the physical world. Right? So that, that also has some requirements for latency. Uh, so, uh, in, in that sense, uh, we, we can say that there are three generic services in 5G where uh, we can offer very high reliability and latency, support very high density of devices at a lower data rate, or give very high data rates. But the way to think about these three services is not that, uh, you know, there will be only these three. These three are eigenvalues, we can say, that can be combined and give you a different service. For example, if you have virtual reality, uh, then you will have some part of it will be broadband, you know, beaming the, the context and so on, but the interaction within that will be with low latency, right? So there will be some services that, that are that are com combination of these two generic services. Um, so the official uh, ITUR terminology of the 5G generic services is EMBB, MMTC, and URLLC. And uh, we have been part of this METIS project where they have been called a little bit differently. They were called ultra-reliable machine type communication, massive machine type communication, and so on. But basically, that is the same idea. And then there are two principal challenges for, for building uh, these systems. One is what we are actually mostly doing now in standardization is designing the technology for each service. So you say, I, have, I want to offer low latency, high reliability. How do I do it? And that's, uh, that, that's one type of, of, of a problem. And this is uh, how to design the separate technology for each of these. But the second is, how do they coexist? And I think this second problem is going to be uh, uh, around for, for a longer time. Because once you standardize the interfaces, there can be more creative way how to combine them and how to you know, take resources from one uh, service, give to the other, and so on. 
So I think there, there are these two different, ideally, they should be solved in parallel, right? But what is happening is uh, there is some framework where these services are, are proposed, they're put into some uh, you know, resource allocation framework, and then we try to do slicing. It's, it's better from architectural point of view, but from mathematical point of view, it's not, it's not optimal, right? So, it is often said that IoT uh, and 5G compared to the previous uh, mobile generations are going to empower different vertical industries. You know, we hear this a lot. So, what, 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 does, mean, what does it mean vertical industry? Can somebody explain? Why do we call it like that? There are industries where previously the ICT sector was not, um, let's say, uh, uh, what's the word? Affecting them, like uh, automotive, agriculture, healthcare, or whatever. So there are industries where communication was not an important, let's say, part, was not an integral part, but now it will become an integral part of their operation. But it's not because of that they are, work, they are, they are called work. For, for example, uh, uh, if, we see, if we take the automotive industry, yeah. there is some connectivity there, right? There, is a, there was this 8.11p, for example, that had been there for, for some years. So it's not that there was, uh, there, was no, there was no connectivity there. Or for example, in the energy systems, they're heavily based on uh, SCADA, right? So that, that's exist for many years. But uh, now we say, when we say that they are vertical services, that means that we provide one horizontal platform for connectivity, and they're all building on that platform. Because previously, as you said, it's, uh, uh, it's not that it was not affecting them but they were sta standing in their own silo. You know, using proprietary technology. Dedicated for their own working. Exactly, so, the, the, so, so within it, within the silo, it has been uh, optimized. Now what you say is, can we offer a platform that can empower all of them? And actually the requirements for all these different guys are different. That's where the heterogeneity comes. Okay, so we demystified what vertical means. So it means that they are vertically built up on a horizontal platform, which is kind of universal for all of them. So some use cases which have been updated with respect to, um, uh, you know, they, they, this, have, this have been growing in the, in the past year. So now the they are, they are updated with respect to what was there in, uh, in Metis, for example, or in the previous projects. So, uh, uh, massive machine type communication. We have environmental monitoring of large areas. Right, sensors, you know, agricultural areas, and so on. Uh, large infrastructures, like roads, ports, industrial plants. And again, uh, some of you might say, well, 15 years ago, wireless sensor networks were also about the same thing. Right? So there, there, is a, there is a big overlap. The point is that now they are into wide area networks, not mesh networks and they're connected. So there is a certain service offered to them. Uh, and this service comes through the link that they have to a certain infrastructure. Right? Uh, available parking places, you know, this is a very often quoted example. Management of object fleets, uh, vehicles, bicycles, and, and so on. So here, uh, in the massive machine type communication, you have to think about use cases where usually we require very low energy. So for example, uh, I heard uh, from uh, use cases from Sigfox where they think about uh, one-time transmission of a device. So the device is there on the object, and if something happens, this device just transmits once in a lifetime. That's it. So that's that's an ultimate, uh, you know, machine type communication. For example, that that uh, some some failure happened and so on. And this device is costs uh, it has a very low price, so it's kind of feasible to to invest in devices that stay calm. But when something happens, they just report it, and then after that, they are not used. Right. So are you aware of other use cases here which are not covered for massive machine type communication? What would be other? 
use cases. Smart metering. Smart metering. Problem with smart metering, it's, uh, uh, I put it here. I think the smart metering started here. And I think it's moving a little bit, not towards low latency, but I think it, it requires uh, improved reliability compared to, for example, uh, yeah, these ordinary sensors. But, but you're right, regarding, regarding the, uh, the, the number, the sheer number of devices is in the area of massive machine type computation, yeah, definitely. Now, in our study as well, it's requiring low latency because the SCADA is not covering you know, that part of the tree. So you have AM, right? mm -hmm. and they are implementing it. They are studying implementing this estimation and monitoring techniques, which require lower latency. So, so now what you are saying is that it's. Um, it's kind of starting to move in the, within this region, right? Because smart metering started here. You see when there's a pictures of smart meters. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying is that requirement-wise is moving towards this direction, right? Yeah. Other examples? So if we go to uh, ultra-reliable low latency communication, there are applications with commercial and public safety. But again, uh, at the time when we started with this ultra-reliable communication, 2012, in Metis it was not called ultra-reliable low latency communication. It's called ultra-reliable communication only. Because there can be uh, use cases in public safety where latency is not very stringent, but the reliability is extremely important. For example, upon disaster, we have a network where the, uh, the SMS uh, message or any safety message can be sent through multiple hops and can arrive within, let's say, hour. So for example, if we have survivors under some ruins so that, that uh, within hour, the authorities can be notified, right? So in that, uh, so actually what we have done at that time is that we have divided, I'm sure you remember, from that, we have divided the ultra-reliable cases into two, into long-term reliability and short-term reliability. So kind of uh, we have put arbitrary this to be at 10 milliseconds. So if it's below 10 milliseconds, it's short-term. If it's above 10 milliseconds, it's long-term reliability. So long-term reliability is also, uh, for example, in smart metering, you can say, I send uh, 50 packets per day, but one of them at least should arrive. And this is not an easy, uh, how it's called, uh, requirement. Why do you think it's not an easy requirement? If you say, make sure that at least one out of pa 50 packets come. If I have an ergodic system where the channel is changing, ergodic means that the channel can be good, bad, is dynamically changing, like with a mobile phone, then actually there is some randomness there so out of 50 packets, some can be good, some can be bad. But if you have a meter, which is in the cellar, with a bad coupling to the base station, I mean, no packet will come through. So the, the point is how you ensure those cases where we have, we have non-ergodic changes of the, of the channel. The channel is constantly bad. That's why I'm saying it's, it's difficult to, to offer reliability for each individual meter uh, when, when we can have this kind of uh, you know, bad coverage and, uh, and, high, and high path losses. So, um, so the point is that if we have ultra-reliable communication but not requirement for low latency, then the key point is how to ensure that there is no excessive jamming and interference, how to ensure that the signal, uh, received signal is there always and so on. Uh, on the other hand, if we have low latency, then all of this has to be done within a very short time. But let's take uh, industrial control and automation. Outer level low latency is in principle feasible there because it's a control environment. Right? It's a, uh, compared to outside, it's a controlled environment where you say, I'm going to offer uh, you know, certain level of reliability, make my deployment within the plant, so to, to offer it. 
smart energy and smart grid is also uh, a relatively controlled system where you can put uh, certain low latency controls, uh, use some wireless interfaces to ensure that you know, the signal arrives within two milliseconds. Uh, V2X and UAV control. That's another case for ultra level low latency. It's a not controlled environment because it's by definition outside, right? So you, it's, it's more unpredictable. But what is uh, advantage with UAV compared to all the other cases is uh, likely a better path loss, right? Because it's a different propagation, not always. Well, better path loss towards your base station and also towards all the interferers. That's the point. So, so, they, so they, 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 then, then you have to identify who is your who is your problem? Your problem becomes interference, right? But in the cellar, when you have the spark meter in the cellar, your problem becomes the signal, right? Uh, when you have V2X, who is your enemy there? What is the problem? Is the signal? Is the interference? Is the multi-user competition? Or all together? And then some new use cases are in augmented reality where we have digital interaction with physical objects. Okay, performance targets. So let's look in, um, into how these modes, massive uh, high density devices, and not reliable compared to the traditional broadband mode. Okay. So uh, if we take, uh, I've used this example quite a bit. If we take, uh, this is the illustration of what is the overhead when we have massive number of devices. For example, uh, if you offer one megabit per second from 100 devices, that's a sum rate, that's a total aggre uh, aggregate rate of 100 megabits per second. So if you take 10 kilobits uh, per second from 10,000 devices, the aggregate rate is again 100 megabits per second. But this here is much easier compared to this here. So why is that? Somebody else, give you a try. What does it what does it mean? Low control against overhead in Chinese and why do you need the control overhead here? So it 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 it's a shared channel so you need to inform the user which user needs to access to the channel and of course you need to change in the physical channel controlling both overhead and PSI and so on. Yeah, so so basically uh, we have to, uh, in order to this to be feasible, there has to be a certain amount of data that can justify the exchange of control information, right? So if we have a massive number of devices, this is more difficult to just justify. So this is the limit of the access protocol, right? Then, uh, again, uh, it's relatively easy to provide 100 megabits 95% of the time. You know, you have it with Wi-Fi, for example. But it's much more difficult to provide even small rate with a very, very high reliability. And the reason is that all wireless systems, basically, digital wireless systems, they have this uh, uh, cliff region here where it works well 10 megabit, 1 megabit per second, and then suddenly goes to zero. The reason is that you go to zero whenever you're unable to keep the control information exchange. Right? So because the, the control information in these systems is designed with respect to expected worst case. Take, for example, LTE. There is certain repetition of the frame. Uh, there's certain coding there. And they say, OK, this is my control information. And if the situation is worse than that, nothing goes through. But if the situation is better than that, almost everything goes through. So that's why you have this uh, cliff region. So the point is how to make 
how to deal with the reliability of the control information in order to enable very, very high reliability of the systems. For example, what is the most reliable system for radio communication that exists that, that fails last, absolutely last? Is analog system. You know, if you, if you, if you speak with a, through analog communication, it, it works under the worst conditions because there is no handshake. There is no exchange of uh, control information, right? That's why it goes through. But on the other hand, architecturally, analog system is a disaster because it's dedicated to a very, very specific service and, uh, and does, not, does not have this uh, universality of bits, right? So the key point of information theory was that it tells you you can use ones and zeros as currency and you can encode any information. But before that, we were taking analog system and say, this is the TV, this is the radio, this is the whatever, the phone. And so, so if you want to have this universality, you have to have signaling. Once you have signaling, you are hitting the limit of reliability. OK? So uh, what are requirements for machine, massive machine type communication? Maybe some of these have been updated. Uh, in the meantime, but uh, uh, 10 to 15 years device battery life, extended coverage, or the coupling loss should be below some value. And um, for example, if you if you, if you look into some, uh, if you take each of the features and go to what could be the key ideas to enable these features, if we say 10 to 15 years device battery life. What could be the key to save battery in a device? What would be a key idea? I don't know, like solar rechargeable panels, stuff like that, so it can be self-sufficient. That is good. That means that renewing the energy, but but not every device. For example, if you have uh, again in the in the cellar, if you have a device, then you cannot have that, right? So if you have a limited battery, what would be the idea to keep it? Sleep mode. Sleep mode. Yeah, sleep But what is the problem with the sleep mode? You cannot receive information when you sleep. You don't know about. Yes, and when you wake up, some th you somehow at some point you have to wake up. So you need a protocol, a wake up protocol, to trigger when you should wake up, and so. so but to trigger, you also need to be semi wake up. You know. Yeah. yeah yes. Of course. Mm -hmm. And also, you don't need to. Also, you should not wake up too often because actually the wake up costs quite a bit. Yeah. This transient. Yeah. Yes. This transient regime, right? So if, if we will see later on how the establishment of connection in LTE looks like, and you know, it's not that you just go to sleep, wake up, send, and everybody is happy. I mean, it's not. It's not that simple. So the solution would be shorter transmissions, not so frequent or not so long. Right? Okay. Problem with, with the shorter transmission is that, as we are going to see in the short block length, it is unreliable. Because uh, the reason why you have well, why you want to have longer transmissions in information theory is that you want your system to start to follow the law of large numbers. And with shorter transmission, you cannot achieve it. So there is. A sac sacrifice of reliability, when energy, you know, uh, latency. There is there is a certain trade-off there. And uh, actually, in one of the papers that we have put for today for presentation, I think it's you yeah, presenting it. Mine. it. One of these trade-offs is captured, but not all possible trade-offs. And this this was relatively the easy case to capture. So, uh, three hundred thousand connected devices per cell. A new radio goes to 1 million devices per kilometer, per square kilometer, right? So you should not think that these 1 million devices should all be connected to the same base station. There, will be, there can be different, uh, how it's called, technologies and architectures that we're going to see now for connecting uh, devices. Low complexity means that uh, you cannot pick your favorite coding and decoding scheme and put it there because it's too complex. And it, can, it, it will increase the price of the device. If we have a device that you send once in a lifetime, 
costs le less than uh, 50 cents, then you cannot put, uh, I don't know, polar codes with uh, 256 uh, QAM, whatever, right? So, uh, so we need efficient transmission of sporadic small payloads, as we, as we mentioned before. But the question is, where is this trade-off? How, how often should we sleep? How often should we wake up? How big the payload should be? Uh, for example, uh, for extended coverage, one of the ideas that have been mentioned was uh, repetition. And this repetition is, uh, from an uh, information theory point of view, the absolutely the worst you can do. You're going to take the signal and just repeat. You can always do some clever coding uh, and, get, and get a better, uh, uh, better game. So uh, per packet reliability might be low, but as I said, there can be some stringent uh, reliability constraint over an extended period. Like for, for smart meter, you will say out of 50 transmissions per day, at least one should arrive. And we saw that this could be quite difficult. Another thing is we can have joint reliability put to the group of IoT devices. You know, for, for example, you have uh, alarm monitoring devices. You deploy redundant sensors. You don't really care that everybody, each of these sensors activates, but you want some to activate with very high reliability. So how do we do it? You know, in, uh, in uh, social psychology, there is this what is called bystander effect. If there is a person in need, and there are few people around, they're going to help. But if there are too many people and nobody helps, you know, this is a bystander effect because they think everybody else is going to help. So if we have here many nodes, so a lot of redundancy, but then you think that everybody else is going to report the alarm, then you have the same effect, right? On the other hand, uh, if, if the nodes try to re reply with high reliability, what's the problem there? together uh, congestion they congestion they're going to try to say the same thing but nothing will come true right so you see that there is a this subtle trade-off between these things okay um, with respect to uh, ultra reliable low latency communication what we are looking into is some latency reliability characterization of the system so what we want to take is we want to take a payload of certain size, for example, 32 bytes, and we say, uh, if these 32 bytes are sent through a given communication system, then what is the probability that uh, th th that packet is going to arrive by a certain time? Right? So the probability is low at the beginning, so as the latency increases, the reliability increases. But then it hits uh, 1 minus PE. So, the, uh, so the, pro the packet never arrives with probability PE. So this is not a cumulative distribution function because a cumulative distribution function adds, ends at 1. This is some scaled down version. So uh, the question is why the packet never arrives? Because in, in probability, what we say in probability is that some event eventually will happen. But here the packet never arrives. So why? What do you think? So you give 32 bytes to a system. I mean, you take million, billion packets of 32, and then you give it to the system. You record the time of arrival, and then you plot this function. Why there are packets that never arrive? Although we, although we say in probability, things eventually will happen. This is an important thing. I'm not sure at all about what I'm going to say. Timeout after retransmission, retransmission, retransmission. Timeout drops packet. Ex 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 that's the point. That's the because point. the protocol, the protocols are not persistent to infinity. They try several times, seven times, for example, in, in Wi-Fi, and they say the packet will not arrive. And this is actually quite OK, because, uh, because this makes the system stable. Otherwise, if I have mobile system where they're connected, and I take them away, so the packet is impossible to arrive, and this is going to transmit the packet forever. Right? So timeout makes the system 
realizable. Okay, so basically the, the general statement would be here that it doesn't arrive because the protocol is not infinitely persistent. So uh, the, this is the blue curve. And then what, if we want to satisfy some better reliability and latency requirement, we can say that the, 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 the red curve is better than the blue curve, right? So because it offers high reliability and lower latency. So the design targets in ultra-reliable low latency communication is that we have uh, uh, in, 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 in broad, sorry, in broadband systems, if we have this curve, what we are looking into is how to push the median of this curve back. So if we have 32 bytes, and the average throughput is equal to uh, 32 divided by the expected time of transmission of this 32, right? So basically what we are saying is that the expected time, which will be closely related also to this uh, middle part here, so expected value is not equal to the median value, of course, but it's the closest thing we can see from this graph. So what we are saying is that decrease the median value, decrease the expected time, so this throughput goes up as an average value. And that's the broadband system. However, in ultra-reliable low latency, we don't really care about it. What we do care about is that there's a deadline and then there is a target reliability, which is equal to this one. And then we want that the system that does not satisfy, we want that that system gets a curve which is going to satisfy. So as long as this line here is hit before the deadline, so we're good. Can you see the difference between the two requirements? The best way to see it is that I can make my system like this. Right? So this system here is satisfying the, 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 the latency, the reliability requirement, but it's not necessarily giving a better throughput. Okay? So one question which comes often is, can we have massive machine type communication and ultra-reliable low latency communication at the same time? You have given an example already, right? Which one? Smart meters and smart grid and uh, metering has massive connectivity. <coughs> it needs ultra-reliability, it needs low latency. No, 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 not, not, not at the same time, because, because it's, it's, it's converging. Smart metering, as we have mentioned before, it, it improves its reliability requirements, also the latency requirement, but, they, they, but these latency requirements are far away from, for example, from factory automation. They're not going to that level. And smart grid, the same. Smart grid, you have, uh, for example, teleprotection. Teleprotection is between uh, the two points which you need to you know, turn off the grid upon a failure. That's not uh, massive. That's very That's specific a, yeah. connection. Okay. But but at the philosophical level, can we have massive communication and ultra-reliable at the same time? It should not be possible. Because if, we, if it was possible, why should we not make the massive to be ultra-reliable? Just forget about the separate class. Actually, the key point is it's in principle possible when the devices have correlated information. So if all devices are sending independent information, you cannot accommodate very high reliability from extremely large number of devices. But if they have correlated information, the alarm example, then in principle you can design your system that the information comes through, but maybe not everybody reports. So uh, the way to think about this is that 
you have sensors, massive amount of sensors, reporting to the base station, let's say. And if each of them has independent information, then uh, the, if this information, uh, the, 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 the amount of information is, is uh, uh, yes, the same per node, then uh, we cannot simultaneously scale the devices, the reliability per device, and the size of this individual data. On the other hand, if there is a physical phenomenon, which is deciding the content of this data, in principle, you can do it because the amount of information here contained in this one is much less than the independent amount of information which comes from many nodes. Right? The question is how to do that. One simple idea would be if, uh, if uh, all of them have the same information or similar information or, or they have you know, some relatively close value of some measurement, then you get only some measurements and if you're happy with the mean value and the variance that you have calculated, you say that the others just don't report. Okay? Then the problem in this case is because uh, uh, for instance that in a real case maybe you are monitoring um, the temperature of a room and you deploy much more sensors then you actually need it. Exactly. So there's a problem of deploying it. Yeah, but the, the, the mathematically correct way of deployment would be, look, each sensor is sampling the space-time, right? So if I put sensor at one point, that means that of the whole space-time, I'm sampling one point. From the sampling theorem, <laughs> We know that we have to know how the space-time changes so that we put the appropriate number of sensors, right? Mm. But I've not seen that people have been, you know, doing this. It's, it's more of some heuristical way of uh, putting the sensors, right? Or maybe, I don't know, in channel uh, measurement, do they make this formal sampling of the space and deciding the number of probes or not? Not really, because that would be the easy case, right? It's kind of controlled uh, physical phenomena, electromagnetic propagation. Okay, so now we're going to speak about the access problem. Yes. Uh, before we move, I have one question. Yes. Now we are putting the information, the correlation of information into the picture. Do we have some other performance metrics that we can use? Instead of only this reading time or uh, time, the information. Yes, in principle, you are right. Yeah. In principle, I now deleted it. Mm -hmm. You can use the distortion of the original information. So instead of measuring the success per sensor, what you're interested in is, is a distortion in the reconstruction of the original information. For example, you have some measurement, uh, if, you, if you have some phenomenon that has cert certain temperature, then not all the sensors are measuring the true temperature. But maybe their combination is going to provide the, the, the true temperature, and then the square distance between the, what the sensors are reporting and whatever the temperature is, is <coughs> one example of a distortion measure. But there are also subjective measures. For example, in, uh, in video transmission, there is this what's called PI, PSINR, PSNR, uh, where which is made, which is a different distortion function, measuring, measuring the deviation from, from the desired signal. OK, let's look into what the access problem is. So we have, in the ba basic setup, we have a set of nodes connected to some base station that, or that, that would like to send 
to the base station in the uplink. And this, there's a large set of potential nodes, but uh, there is a, there, but the, the base station does not know who has something in transfer. Actually, this is the key point here, that there is uncertainty about who wants to transmit at a given time. Because if there is no uncertainty about that, then the base station can send a signal scheduling them saying, this is the order by which you should do the things. Right? So, so the key point is that there is, uh, the base station does not know who wants to transmit. But also, they do not know between themselves. Because if the nodes uh, know who has data to, to transmit, somehow they know who has a data to transmit at this time, actually they can, ha they can make an implicit order. Each node has a unique address, MAC address, right? So I say, okay, I have packet, Aras has, Hirli has, and you know, Rene has. We have we four have packets. So Rene's address is the highest because we know each other. We, we have uh, seen it. Hirli is second, Aras is third, I'm the fourth. So I say, okay, so we all say, let him transmit. There's an implicit agreement. However, the question there is, how do the device know who has packet and the base station doesn't know? Because at the moment they will try to inform each other that they have packet, the base station will learn and then the problem collapses. Right? So let's see the overhead of this problem. Let's say that we have n quick access uh, assessment of the overhead. We have n nodes. We have k nodes that are active. If n and k are known, if we, for a specific value of k and n, the uncertainty about the activation in this set using traditional information theory could be logarithm 2 n over k, right? Because uh, n choose k, there are n choose k sets of devices, each of them equally probable to be active. These are all the possible ways in which they can be active, right? So this amount of information is maximized when uh, k is equal to n half. Or let's say that when the probability of activating a device is one half, then the amount of information that lies into the state of a device is one bit. That's the highest you can get. On the other hand, massive machine type uh, communication works with assumption of sporadic low intensity access where k is much less than n. And uh, we have, uh, that's why we, we resort to random access protocols. Where the devices know that if, if they schedule them, then there might be a long waiting time because a lot of them will not have nothing. If there is half of them that are active, then the random access would also not be good because there will be a lot of collisions, right? But why I make this point here is that keep in mind that the activation of the device, which is the protocol information, is one bit per device. So on the other hand, let's say that each device has 200 bytes of packet. So that means that this one bit of information contained in the state of the device is controlling the transmission of 200 bytes. So this is one uh, illustration of why we put more value to the control information when we encode it compared to the data. Because we have a single bit controlling many other bits. Right? The problem with this single bit is that it's only known at that device. And communicating it to the others is, is kind of the, the whole point of the problem. So let's look how. Uh, LT random access looks like. This is a traditional uh, LT protocol where we have uh, uh, 
random access preamble, then response, then connection request, and so on. There are a lot of messages before we come to a state where we can send data. Okay? And then, of course, it's infeasible that every time a device goes to sleep, to go through the full sequence, because there's a lot of exchange here. And imagine if the, the message is two bytes, then you go through all this, and then you send two bytes and you go to sleep. It's not efficient, right? So, furthermore, th another problem with this is that once you have a procedure which has so many steps, many steps have to go correctly for the whole procedure to be correct. Right? If, if, if there is a failure in any of this, then you, 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 know, you need to restart, send again, and so on. So this is kind of the minimal procedure, the minimal investment that you should make as a device to go to the uh, transmission state. So this actually leads to the ideas of grant-free access, where you don't negotiate all these things, you just send your data. Right? So this is uh, something which has been considered within, within 5G. So, uh, so basically, if you look at the procedure, this is the access attempt, the random access, and then there is a connection establishment and security negotiation procedure. Okay? Then um, this is uh, this is a, this is the simplest architecture where we have a base station, a central point, and all devices want to access to the base station. There is another architecture which is called uh, cellular architecture with capillary access network. So basically, we start from uh, this architecture. This is what we discussed before. And then we say, what if instead of putting LTE or wide area to all these devices, just put some short range unlicensed technology to all devices. They connect through unlicensed band. And then this is kind of aggregating the packets and transmitting to the base station. Of course, this is the other extreme. There's the intermediate solution where we have you know, uh, several uh, intermediate base stations. This is the capillary network, and this is the wide area. So pros are, it's removing the contention from the base stations, and it's putting it to the aggregators. Yes? No, no, no. This is here. This here is a license band. Yeah. And this here is still a license, but this is, for example, unlicensed. Oh, okay. But it, but if you have used LPWA technologies, this is also unlicensed. The wide area one. You know. So that, that is all all these possible variants. But what I'm trying to say is that here we have a wide area contention from from many devices that will contend to the same. So using this idea of aggregator you're confining the contention to a smaller region, right? So the pros are that remove the contention from the BS and put it to the aggregators. For example, here, each aggregator has less contention compared to the base station. Another thing is that the aggregated packets, which are sent from here, they are more efficient with respect to overhead because you aggregate from several devices and you transfer. It supports low power operation because it's kind of does, uh, it requires lower power here, and it does kind of the negotiation with the base station on behalf of all devices. But of course, there is a, a, a cost in terms of uh, additional infrastructure. So this is not in pros, but it should have been in the next slide. And in latency, right? Because there's some processing latency. Having said that, uh, other uh, other fact, uh, actually disadvantages are that it moves the contention to unlicensed spectrum. But this spectrum is actually less predictable. So it's, not, it's easy to say, I'm going to just move the contention from a wide area base station to an unlicensed spectrum. But this spectrum, uh, the, uh, you don't have the power to manage the interference in unlicensed spectrum. That's actually why the spectrum license is so expensive, because you pay to get the right 
to various interfaces. Instead of having, let's say, Wi-Fi hotspot, which is unlicensed, wouldn't we have a relay-based station which is licensed instead of this? In principle, yes. Yes, yes. So we can have heterogeneous networks. So I'm going to come next to, the, to, that, uh, to another infrastructure, but you're right. Uh, it, it, we, are going to, we are going to have uh, a license spectrum deployed. It relays, of course, then the question is, how is uh, this deployment of license of the, if it's the same spectrum going to be, right? It's a heterogeneous network deployment. Yeah. Uh, and it's also, <laughs> in the extreme case, the contention problem here, we should not believe that the contention problem here is much easier than the contention problem here, right? Because the same number of devices. So, so what I'm saying is that there is no single solution to this, but there are these options where you can outsource something to the capillary network. Right? For example, if the uh, activation of devices from wide area are correlated in time, then it's actually better to have local aggregators because you decrease the number of collisions locally. Right? You're not competing with the others from the other side of the cell. So this is one example. Uh, how, how actually we work with, with LTE. We have two machine type devices transmitting to the aggregator, and the aggregator kind of negotiates with the base station the connection. And uh, if, if they would do it individually, they would all have to go through this uh, many steps procedure. And then actually your question about why don't we deploy a relay, the advantage will disappear because with the relay you have to go through the same steps. Here the question is, how can you go with lighter steps with another technology, not going through the link establishment, and then use the link establishment procedure of the aggregator to send all the packets? <coughs> right? So actually, you can show that uh, if the packets arrive within some timing, they can make use of this established connection and kind of feed the link from the aggregator to the base station and use, 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 use this connection. But another important message from this here is uh, that we can use generalized, we can take a generalized view on multiple radio interfaces. The use of capillary and cellular network is an example of a serial use of different interfaces. Because we have capillary link, this is uh, one interface. We have wide area link, this is another interface. So this is access point for interface one, access point for interface two. So it's a serial. Why did we do it? We did it to improve the coverage and to reduce the contention, right? To deal with density. But actually, you can also make a parallel use of multiple interfaces, just like resistors. <laughs> so this is AP for interface one and AP for interface two. And there's an endpoint. Why would you do this? Yes? Reliability. Exactly. So this is uh, reliability and latency. So that means that parallel use of multiple interfaces is suitable to support uh, the latency reliability characteristics that we desire. So for example, if you have two interfaces with these latency reliability characteristics, when they are added up in some clever way, for example, through repetition or through some coding across interfaces, the resulting reliability latency curve is this one. which is better than each of the individual reliability latency curves. OK? Are there questions, by the way? OK, so uh, let's look in the cloud architecture. So this is one example of paper we, I participated in, where we take a cloud architecture, and kind of we are bringing the remote radio heads closer to the devices. So, so this means that we are also using the idea of reduced contention, not, not, not the devices which are not spatially collocated, they're not contending with each other, because they're not, the, they're not transmitting to the same radio head. Right? So, uh, 
So the point is that we bring the infrastructure closer to the devices, they transmit, but the devices, uh, uh, but, but the remote radio heads are transmitting to the central unit for processing. Right? They can do part of the action locally, or they can outsource everything to the central unit. So the advantage, obviously, is that, as I said, we're reducing the contention. We are picking the signals from multiple. The, the signal, for example, of this device will be picked by this and this. So there's some diversity. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this device is, is uh, connected here. This is connected here. This is connected on this tree, for example. And by this diversification, we can distinguish between the devices, right? But what is the problem in this architecture? What, what, are the, what is the cost in this architecture? Alex? You might aggregate the packet from one user from multiple regions, right? But that's not necessarily a disadvantage, because if yeah. you're not decoding it, yes, that's true. you're kind of, uh, you I mean, in the, in the extreme case, you take analog signals and you forward analog signals, right? So you don't, not, you, not analog, quantized signals, yes? In some part, I agree it's the cooperation overhead in terms of capacity for the front floor. In terms of synchronization, when, let's say, you want to have joint transmission, as an extreme example, uh, these two are very important. But that would be for the downlink. Here we're speaking about uplink. Yeah, now we're speaking about uplink, OK. We're speaking about uplink. So yeah. all, all the time, I'm thinking this architecture that I have in my mind downlink all the no. time. <laughs> Guy. So, <laughs> the point here is that uh, there is a loss due to digital transport over the front home. Because to, to transport the signals here, you cannot transport the exact signals. You have to point that. You have to do something. Right? So, for example, in the paper I have mentioned, what we do is we compare two different architectures. One where you quantize the signal here, forward the quantize the signal to the central unit, and then the central unit uh, Takes a, you know, rec recovers the signal from the quantized version, but because they were quantized, now the signals are noisy, and tries to combine them. That's one way to do it. Another way is actually to, that they do some detection here, and they report based on their detection locally. They say, I think I've seen this and this and this device. Then the other says, I think I've seen this, this and this device. You know, you're kind of reporting a decision or uh, soft information about your decision. So the idea, when you start to trade off the functionality between the central unit and the, uh, and the edge, this is usually called FOG <coughs> architecture, right? FOG. Meaning that you, you don't do everything centralized, you don't do everything, uh, how it's called, uh, in, a in, a, in a remote radio heads, but there is some uh, combination. Actually, uh, it, so we can have local decisions, which is called edge computing, versus centralized decision, which is cloud. Edge computing is one of the enablers of the low latency. Because if you can keep some decisions locally, you know, your response time is, uh, is much slower. That's one, one, one of the possible architectures for low latency. So, let us look into the access problem in a vehicular setting, which is quite different. So in a vehicular setting, when you want to inform all the neighboring cars, the, obje the, uh, the objective is to spread the same message to them, but each vehicle has the same objective. So there is no single receiver. But we want that all devices broadcast their message to all, so that they figure out who is around, and they come with a consensus what to do, right? Hopefully with a short time. <laughs> so uh, the problem here is the fundamental trade-off which appears is because of the half-duplex nature of the devices. If you talk too much, you will not hear what the others have to say, and an opposite. So the network model is that you have uh, cars, for example, and then there is a periodic broadcast, but because uh, the cars have randomized position, this periodicity of the broadcast is not, uh, they're not scheduled. Every, every, every device has its own period, 
and this period is random with respect to the others, right? So kind of you can say that all the cars, which are within some region, they want to send to each other information about their presence. So here is the, the point, that we have users A1, 2, up to M. When user A is transmitting, it cannot hear anything else which is coming. On the other hand, uh, the same for all the other devices. So the question is, what should be the percentage of time that you should transmit your message versus gathering the other messages? You know what? In order to come to a consensus. So op we are talking about optimal stopping time, let's say. Not optimal stopping time only, but uh, what should be the optimal amount that you talk so that you know that you are updated with all your neighbors? Okay. And. Um, also, some packets are lost due to uh, erasures, right? They don't arrive even because of the noise. So this problem is quite different from the ordinary access problem, where we have a single receiver that needs to receive the packet. Here, there is all to broadcast, so we kind of need to receive all the packets and make sure that we make the same decision. Where, for example, the decision is that this line uh, uh, drives, but this other line doesn't drive. So we have actually tried to generalize this problem in something which we call distributed handshake. So it's not enough that I transmit my packet to you, because when you are when you are driving, you kind of figure out where the other guys have seen you, right? If the other guy is looking somewhere else, then you're not really comfortable, right? So that, so 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 that means that means that you can make this handshake where you know that the other guy knows that you know that uh, you know, this, uh, <laughs> but this sounds funny, but actually all the communication protocols work like this, right? Try to interpret TCP with words, right? TCP says, hello, I'm here. And then he says, I know you're there. And then he says, I know that you know I'm there, right? Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, this is TCP. And here we have a handshake. We want to figure out that not only that we transmit the packet, we want to figure out who got our packet as well. And this is changing the problem to something really interesting. So we can find some, uh, uh, some consideration in this, in, this, uh, in this paper. So uh, I don't know whether this should be the place where we can make a short break, 15 minutes. And we start uh, 10.40 again. <laughs>